welcome everyone to, um, to this late session on uh, booting your microservices architecture with Spring and Netflix. Um, I'm going to do the talk in English, um, mostly to uh, draw all of the uh, non-Dutch speakers into, uh, into this particular track, obviously. Um, my name is Joris Kuipers. I'm uh, what I typically refer to myself, at least, as a hands-on architect at uh, Trifork. Uh, I have an official job title, but it includes the word manager. So it's embarrassing, and I'd rather not talk about it. Um, it's been a while, actually, since I've been at the uh, JFL conference. I think uh, last time I was there, at, um, both to attend and to speak, was six, seven years ago. So, uh, well, thank you guys for having me back. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk quickly about the, um, uh, the concept of microservices, but this is the microservices track, and we've had, like, I don't know, probably dozens of talk already that uh, somehow refer to microservices. So I'll keep this brief, uh, don't worry. Uh, and then I'm going to do uh, a much more hands-on uh, presentation, including some uh, live coding, uh, to show you what it actually means to build web services using a particular stack uh, consisting of uh, a new project called Spring Cloud uh, combined with the Netflix open source stack. So why web services? Well, um, like I said, uh, you've probably been hearing a lot about this today already. Uh, the typical advantage that's being touted is uh, scale. And typically what people mean with scaling is uh, scaling from an operational point of view. We want to be able to uh, basically build things at web scale, uh, and to do that quickly and to respond to uh, sudden increases in demand, uh, we want to be able to do that using things like cloud and using individual services that can scale for themselves. Now, me personally, uh, and looking at the projects that we're working on at Trivork, for example, um, I can typically scale just fine building a well-structured monolith and deploying that onto a number of nodes, keeping it mostly stateless, putting a load balancer in front. Um, there might be some challenges there, but they don't necessarily require microservices in order to, um, to be uh, uh, handled, basically. What I personally find much more interesting, and again, this is something that you may have heard a couple of times already, is the business agility part. Um, what we have noticed is that in projects, that have become successful over the years as a product uh, that have a lot of customers but also have ongoing development, um, keeping everything into this one big monolithic app tends to not scale that well. And I'm not talking about scale from an operational point of view, I'm talking about scaling things from a development and from a business point of view. And there, it really helps if uh, you have started out with something that's actually well structured and you can take out parts that you say, this actually has a different development life cycle, for example. We want to be able to deploy this thing much more often than some other parts of our application. Um, or uh, there is a particular area where we see new functionality being created all the time, and maybe only for a short period that we actually need this. In our case, for example, this uh, typically is integration related. So we have a product that integrates with lots of other products from other vendors, where we do not control those other services, obviously. Uh, so we build integration where we have to build web service clients, we have to offer web services to them. Uh, this is really something, uh, in my experience, that uh, a web services based, and therefore also a more microservices, individually deployable services architecture can really help a lot. It also helps to say those new projects can actually use the latest technology available, whereas you might have some dependency uh, in some other legacy system that you have already that prevents you from using things like the latest Java version or the latest version of some library or some framework that you would really like to incorporate in your project. So those are all factors that can drive you more towards uh, what is basically a distributed architecture. So distributed systems is what we're getting into if we're moving into a microservices world. How hard can it be? Well, uh, as a lot of people know, and hopefully uh, from experience as well, it's actually pretty tricky. Uh, taking a system that can just do a local method call and then just pretending that it's the same thing to make that call across the network to some other remote service or set of services, it's really a completely different thing. Um, you may have heard of things like the eight fallacies of distributed computing. Uh, those fallacies are things like network calls are free, the network cannot fail, every call will also succeed, services will always be there, and obviously none of those cases are actually true. So that means that you need to think about resilience as the 
uh, term nowadays is being used. You need to build resilient systems that can cope with parts of your infrastructure or other services being unavailable or, what's oftentimes even worse, um, being available but not responding in a timely fashion, for example, which can drag down a whole system if you don't take this into account. So that means that when you move in from a single application into this more of a distributed services-oriented style, I'm not necessarily talking about hundreds of microservices, but even just a dozen or two dozen services, um, you're don't getting things for free. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Is, uh, if you actually Google this, uh, together with the term microservices, you'll find a really nice blog explaining some of the issues there. One of the issues, for example, and again, nothing new, hopefully, is that you'll have to automate everything because manually deploying two dozens of web services or microservices that change all the time is really not an option. Monitoring those things at runtime, again, is something that you'll have to automate. So there's a lot of things you need to get right. But in general, I think a lot of those things are important anyways to have. So it's worth investing in them, even if you're not immediately going to build this huge uh, system with, uh, with dozens and dozens of microservices. So because of these new challenges, um, a lot of new solutions are appearing. And um, obviously, everyone talks about Docker when it comes to this. And this is very much an operations thing, right? Uh, where do we deploy all of these small services without needing a full-blown virtual machine for, for every little service? Well, that's really where Docker comes into play. It makes it really easy to, to have uh, efficient uh, use of your resources, especially also in the cloud, where you can dynamically scale things up. I'm not going to talk about any of that. Uh, this is a space in itself, and uh, well, the previous speaker actually in this room ha already talked about things like Kubernetes. Uh, you've probably heard terms like Mesos, Marathon appearing. Um, other products, for example, from the HashiCorp corpor uh, Corporation uh, are appearing in this space as well. You may know this company from uh, a product called Vagrant, uh, which is something that can help you to spin up virtual machines, basically. This is from the pre-Docker era. But nowadays, they are mostly known for um, a product uh, which is uh, also available as open source uh, called Console. And this is uh, a product that can help you with things like service discovery, uh, shared configuration management, and that is addressing all, already a lot of the things that I'd like to talk about today. Finally, um, companies like Netflix, which are not, in fact, companies that build software for, uh, uh, as a product to sell to other people, uh, but simply because they needed to run their own services. Um, they have become very active in sharing some of the solutions that they came up with um, to solve these particular issues. And that's actually uh, what I'm going to show you uh, today. So because we have these new problems and these new solutions, um, it also means that you'll have to deal with new abstractions that are appearing at the application level, um, mostly related to having all of this distribution in there. Like, how do I actually make a call to another service? Do I do that in a synchronous fashion over HTTP? Or uh, would I rather do this in an asynchronous fashion so that I'm not relying on other services being available all the time? Does that work for my particular architecture? How do I deal with configuration? Right? Um, coming from a uh, traditional ap application background, I'm very used to just shipping some properties files uh, that have the configuration for my application. Uh, if you have uh, dozens and dozens of, uh, of services that may need some configuration that is shared, some configuration that's actually tailored to the particular environment that they're running in, it really doesn't scale. You want to manage the uh, configuration itself as an asset somewhere centrally. Uh, and the same goes, of course, for those services. If you deploy something, how do other services know where it is? So you need service registration, you need service discovery, uh, and you need to be able to actually look into all of that. Um, if I make a call to a service, how do I, uh, and even if, uh, if I know that services are available, how am I going to make sure that I call the right one? Am I going to do this based on maybe DNS and have some smart DNS system that says, okay, you can just have this logical host name and I'll route you to the right service? Or maybe I want to do this on the client side. Maybe the application itself should actually know about the variety of services that exist and choose the best one from its own perspective. For example, the one with its, the lowest latency. Um, so going away from all of these abstractions, um, one of the things that matters here 
is how do you actually architect your application to deal with all of this? And um, something that has become uh, quite popular in this space of, of cloud and services-based applications is something called 12-factor app. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in any detail. I'd just like to mention it here. You can look it up uh, for yourself. But basically, this is an architecture that explains things like configuration needs to be external to your application. Um, Information that says, uh, depending on an environment, my application needs to respond differently, needs to be handled there. Um, you need to be able to treat things as uh, standalone units, et cetera, et cetera. Definitely something that I think, as a developer especially, that you should look into um, if you're considering to uh, take on these kind of, of architectures. So moving to the actual topic of the talk, um, in, I'm a Spring guy. Uh, I used to work for Spring Source, uh, and actually I still do uh, Spring trainings uh, every now and then. And um, one of the things that's happening uh, in, in, in that particular um, area, or that particular um, uh, company actually, because it's mostly the Pivotal company developing this, is that they are also very much nowadays a cloud company. So there is a, a whole new set of projects basically uh, coming together to help you as developers build applications that work inside of these microservices-based architectures. So what you see here on this screen, on the left-hand side, are a number of projects that are already available um, in a production-ready uh, state from the first release train of uh, something called Spring Cloud. So Spring Cloud is basically an umbrella of a number of sub-projects. I'm going to talk about the first two in detail. I'm going to show you um, Spring Cloud Config, and I'm going to talk about the Netflix support. But you can see there's a bunch of other stuff there, command line interfacing that integrates with the Spring Boot uh, command line interface, if you happen to know what that is. There's integration with messaging systems. This is particularly interesting to broadcast things like interesting events onto the network. I talked a little bit already about things like shared configuration. If your shared configuration changes, your services might need to know that their configuration uh, needs to be updated at runtime, uh, where, whereas you don't want to restart systems all the time for, to pick up new configuration changes. So a bus can do that. There's integration with Amazon Web Services. Uh, security is mostly about things like OAuth, OAuth 2, uh, which are becoming the predominant model of handling security in a distributed uh, architecture, distributed services fashion. Um, and there's, uh, there's some other stuff for connecting to things like services that you may find in a variety of cloud environments. Actually, um, this is uh, something that a lot of people are very actively building upon. And um, this week, the second milestone of the um, second release train of Spring Cloud uh, just became available. And you can see on the right-hand side here that there's a, a whole new set of projects in there. Uh, for example, as an alternative to uh, some of the things that you can find in the Netflix stack, Consul, which I mentioned before from HashiCorp, is now actively supported. Uh, uh, also, um, uh, ETCD, which is not mentioned here. Um, there is um, a project called Sleuth. Uh, Sleuth is interesting. It's basically distributed tracing. You may be familiar with the problem of um, having a request, going through your application, then seeing a bunch of log statements. But in a concurrent application, you need to be able to see what statements belong to what user. Well, this same problem, um, but then increased uh, by, uh, by uh, some factor, uh, also uh, appears in a distributed system where you need to be able to see, okay, calls, or logical calls for a particular use case from a particular user uh, are entering the system. They result in fan out calls, for example, to other applications, um, other systems. They also do things. They also do logging. How do you actually see what was done in order to handle a single user request? That's exactly what this will do. Uh, it basically adds metadata to all of your service calls and it makes sure that you can track that uh, as your requests moves across the network. So without further ado, um, what I'd like to do is just zoom in on two of these modules that I mentioned, namely cloud and Netflix, by just showing you how you could actually use these things inside of a Java-based application. So for that, I've done a little bit of preparation. Um, what I have here is a small set of services. Uh, let me make this still a bit bigger. There we go. So um, what you see is that, uh, first of all, I have a little service here called the talk service. Um, I'm not very creative when it comes to examples. So if I'm speaking at a conference, I'll just create something that shows talks at a conference. 
Um, so what we have here is a little application. It's a Spring Boot app. So uh, this is really just a one-liner starting up the application. What the application does is uh, it has an MVC controller. So this can handle HTTP requests. And what it will do is uh, it handles talk, uh, requests to a slash talk resource, and it responds by returning a list of talk. And you can filter on the talks by name or by speaker, basically. So um, what I can do is I can start this up. There we go. And while this is starting up, let me switch here to a command line and make that a bit bigger as well. There we go. So what I can do is I can make an HTTP call now. This thing is running on port 8881, and it has a talk resource. And when I look at what this returns, uh, it will give me in JSON uh, a list of a couple of talks that were presented at uh, this very conference. Uh, the first of all uh, being my, the first one being my talk, and then one from uh, my ex colleagues uh, Yato Kunradi and also one from Roberto. So. Let's say that um, this is a service that uh, needs some configuration because it's a microservice. It doesn't really do much uh, apart from serving up uh, talks. It needs its own configuration from a centralized server. How does that work? Well, there is a separate project, as I mentioned, uh, in Spring Boot called the uh, Spring Cloud Config Server. Uh, oh, the way to start that config server is actually pretty easy because there is a dedicated annotation for it. So what I have here is another boot application with an at enable config server. You combine that with the right dependency and this will just start up an HTTP server. This HTTP server will be backed by typically a Git repository. There are some alternatives, but that's the basic mode that it operates in. Um, in a real application, that would probably be some remote Git repository, maybe hosted on GitLab in your own environment, for example. It could even be an external one hosted on something like GitHub, because this thing will just create a local copy of the Git repository, so you don't have to worry about availability in that sense. Um, if you look at what I did here, is I'm just using a local Git repository because uh, I really do not like relying on conference Wi-Fi when I do demos uh, live for an audience. So I have a local Git repository here instead. So what's in the Git repo? Well, it's, in my case, properties files. Um, so this is the Git repository. And I have an application properties here. And um, everything that I put in here will be um, a default for all of the applications that get their configuration from this server. So in this case, you can see I only have one configuration value. I'll explain what this value actually is later on when I talk about Eureka. And I have um, a properties file for some specific service, namely my talk service, um, and also for the talk service if it runs in a dedicated development mode. So let me first start up this server. And um, rather than doing it in my IDE, I'll just do it from the command line because I'm going to keep this running for a bit. Um, so being a Spring Boot app, uh, I can use the uh, Spring Boot Run command here. And this will quickly start up this application. And when this thing is done, it offers a REST API that allows me to find uh, the configuration for my particular service. So it's running. Let me show you what this can do. Uh, this thing is running on port, what was it in? I think 8,000. So how does this work? Well, basically, um, if you have multiple services uh, existing in some environment, the environment itself is actually pretty important, right? It could be that for my acceptance environment, for my production environment, I need different settings. Um, also, uh, I might have... Um, things like versioning uh, being applied. So maybe I have an old version of, a, of a, some service running and I have a newer version. And again, that might be uh, important in terms of configuration that we need. So let's say I want a configuration for a service called some service. Then I can provide these environments, basically. So what I can do is I can say, this thing is running with a default profile, no special profiles here. And uh, I'd really like just to get the configuration from the Git master branch. This could be a branch. This could also be a Git tag, for example. Um, so you can use this for things like dedicated versions. Um, if I do this, then uh, what you see is that I'm getting back some JSON. And it says, uh, I found actually one property source that is applicable to this particular service, because there is no dedicated properties file for some service called some service. And um, it's this one, the application properties. And that one has the uh, Eureka client service URL default zone key with a particular value. This is basically how this works. Now, 
this JSON can be easily interpreted by other clients that are using Spring Cloud Config. Uh, you could also just ask for a collapsed version of all of this that just gives you something like a simple properties file if you want to access this from just any application that is not Java or that is Java but is not using Spring Cloud. Um, actually, it's fairly easy to do that. What you would do then is the branch actually goes to the front. So you say, on the master branch, I'd really like to see the configuration for some service and just give it to me as a properties file. Right. Uh, let's see, I made a mistake there. Master some service. There we go, in the default configuration. There. So now what you see is that I'm getting back only a single line in a properties file format um, that's easily uh, consumable by as many clients as you might have. Um, what you see here is what I forgot is you can actually um, include, or you have to include, the, um, the profiles or the environments or whatever you may call them uh, for your particular applications uh, as part of the uh, configuration name that you're asking like this. Now, if I go to my uh, directory where this Git repository lives, so that is the, uh, let's see, yes, this one, and I ask where I am. You can see that I'm currently on a, uh, on a master branch. So what I could do is I could say, well, uh, let's uh, check out a new branch called uh, demo. So now I'm on the demo branch. And um, going back into my ID, I can make uh, a change to my application properties here. So I could say, um, let's add a new one. The uh, greeting here that I'm going to do is uh, hello jfull, right? I'm going to commit this. There we go. So this is now committed on that particular branch. Right, let me show you it once again. I'm on the branch demo. I've committed everything. So um, what I can do now is basically do the same type of HTTP call that I was making before. But I can say, well, rather than the master, I would really like to see the demo version of this. And now you can see that my greeting is actually included. Right, so you get a lot of configurability here. Um, you can have uh, multiple environments being served. You can have multiple profiles being served. You can say, I want to have shared configuration. You want to have configuration on a per-service basis. Um, and um, there's actually more here that uh, I uh, unfortunately do not have time to demo. Uh, but uh, for example, uh, other things that are available is you can have multiple Git repositories backing a single configuration server. So this would be nice if you say, well, for development and for testing and maybe acceptance testing, uh, I, I just have a repository that everyone can access. But for my user acceptance test and production environments, I would actually like to have something that is much more locked down because not everyone is, is allowed to change configuration there. So you can just have different Git repositories and then inside of the configuration for the config server, you can say um, which requests need to be backed by what uh, Git server. You can also have encrypted configuration. Again, a really important thing, I think, in, in, in a lot of organizations where developers are not always allowed to know things like uh, production passwords of databases. Although I'm, I think in this new world of microservices, it's becoming more and more common that you just manage the whole thing anyways. But if that is a thing in your particular organization, then uh, this can actually support the notion of encrypted property values, where you have to provide a key to uh, both encrypt and decrypt the values from the client that actually accesses the configuration server. So other clients will not be able to see what's in there, basically, if you need confidentiality. So that's basically that. So um, how do we use this thing from our application, right? Because that's really the, the interesting part here. So if I go back to my, uh, to my little talk application, um, the first thing I need to do is I need to add a dependency here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a dependency on something called Spring Cloud Starter Config. And this is the project that creates the client that knows how to talk to one of these configuration servers, extract values from there. And then what it does, if you're a little bit familiar with how Spring works, it, is it basically creates a dedicated property source. So this will just be another thing that I can get configuration values from, just like local properties files or whatever you may have. The other thing I need is I need to tell my application, where, where is this config server? 
So uh, in this case, what I have is a little file called bootstrap properties that says uh, I am the talk servers, um, so I know what configuration to get, and I'm going to get it from uh, some environment variable that points to my configuration server, because this is something that's really easy if you use something like Docker. You can just pass environment variables and extract that. But I'm going to have a default here that says localhost 8000. That's really where I need to get this stuff from. Now, obviously, I need some configuration for this service. So um, let's go to my controller. And let's say uh, I just added a greeting, right? So let's say a private string greeting here. And I want to make sure that I get this thing from my environment. So I'm going to use a net value. I'm going to say, uh, there we go, just get the greeting string. And in order to see it, I'll just create a new endpoint request mapping that listens to uh, maybe slash greet and say uh, string, sorry, greet. And it just returns that instance variable, right? Now, um, I don't actually have a greeting yet on my master branch. I only have one on my dev branch. Let me fix that first, and then I'll, uh, I'll run the application. So um, going back into this one and going back onto the master branch, There we go. Um, I'm going to say greet is simple. Hello. Did I use greet or greeting? Uh, I already forgot. Thank you for that. Let's assume it's this one, and it will blow up if it isn't. Uh, I'll just fix it. That's live coding. OK, so uh, I'm going to restart the app. And um, basically, what you should be seeing now is that at startup, this thing will connect to my configuration server, and it will uh, get its configuration from there. So I can see that. Um, if I scroll up a bit here, you can see that, uh, where is that? Here. Well, let me first just try it out and I'll, uh, here we go. The property sources are here. So at startup, boot will actually tell me wh where am I getting my stuff from. You can see here I have a composite property source, and in this case, it's using my Git URL. Now, my Git URL is just a file-based one, but in a, an actual production system, this would typically be an HTTP-based Git URL. And it will be a local clone, right? It will not be your, your actual Git repository. So with that, um, I should be able to make a call now to my talk servers and say, uh, show me greet. Oh, I missed an eight there. There we go. And we see the simple hello. Uh, let's say that I want to restart um, in a different uh, profile so that I can get my configuration from some other branch. There is a variety of ways that you can do that, but uh, one of the easy ways is to simply say uh, set a property on the uh, on system. It's interesting. Oh, let me just type it in. I'm pretty sure it works. Spring.profile.active. And I'll set it to dev because that's the branch that we created. No, it's a forget it's a wrong system, maybe. Did I? Uh, yeah. Ah, thanks for that. It's the uh, IntelliJ folding that was tripping me up. There we go. So that should help. OK, so thank you for that. Uh, let me restart the application and then just show you that we should now be getting our, um, our different configuration value. Um, while um, this thing is starting up, uh, the only thing I'm showing you so far is configuration that you're getting at startup. It will be injected, and it will be used, but it, it won't actually change anymore. Um, yep, exactly. Cool. So let me turn this to demo, and I'll show you in a moment that it works. Now, like I said, this is static, right? This is one time only. Uh, this may be OK for certain things. 
uh, maybe database connections, right? Uh, you can, in most uh, environments, you can assume that databases uh, will be relatively stable or there will be some DNS resolving around it. So you don't all, all of a sudden need a different database connection URL. But other things may be much more flexible, so you may want to be able to change them on the fly, basically, and have your applications respond. And traditionally, that's actually a, a, a tricky thing with, um, with these sorts of dependency-injected values. Um, the last thing I want to show you here before we move on is a new annotation called Refresh Scope. This is just uh, an annotation if, if I show you what's inside. It's a trivial thing. It's really just saying add scope, refresh, but doing it in a type safe manner. If I add this, then basically what happens is um, my Spring Bean will be a proxy that will, will be reloaded uh, when you tell the application, I want you to update your configuration because something has changed. So um, this is really the only thing I need to do for that. So let me restart the application. We should first see then my demo specific greeting. And while it's running, let me check out that branch. There we go. So uh, making the same call again. I made some mistake. So I'll just uh, do, the, do the master branch then. Check out master. There we go. So we're seeing simple hello. What I can do now is I can go to my um, application properties from the configuration server here and change this to updated hello. Here we go. I'm going to commit this. There we go. So nothing will happen yet, right? If I go back, I will still see the old value because um, here. Uh, because I haven't told my application that its configuration has changed. You don't want the application to pull and all the time refresh itself. That would be too much. What you can do instead, and this could be done using something like a messaging bus that will automatically do this for you, but I'm going to do it by hand here, is you can actually do a post on a special endpoint. And that endpoint is called refresh. So if I do that, this thing will actually go back into the uh, configuration server, and it tells me, oh, the greeting key has actually changed. So I've updated my greeting key. And if you look in the console here, you can see that it closed actually an application context and created a new one. That's a new context that is created on top of your own application context that holds that property source for you. That's a lot of technical talk, but basically what it means is that if I go back to this, I can now see my updated hello value. And I didn't restart my app. So these are the sort of things that, that are possible with um, uh, a project like uh, Spring Cloud Config. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is the Netflix open source stack. So what Netflix has is a, a number of projects that they open sourced um, that they are using in their own stack, um, but that you can use in your own applications as well. And probably one of the most no well-known ones is one called Hystrix, which has this logo. Uh, I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. Another one is Eureka. This is a, a, a service registry. So you can use this for service registration and discovery. Uh, other things uh, that are also from the Netflix um, environment, but not necessarily related to microservices, Rx Java. There was an entire workshop today, actually, on reactive programming. So if you have attended that, you know what this is. Uh, this is basically making sure that you can make non-blocking calls in a very efficient manner in your application, which is especially interesting in the microservices world if you're doing lots of fan-out calls to a lot of different services. And you don't want to just block and wait and do them sequentially. Also, there is something called Zool. Um, there is no project logo that I'm aware of for Zool, uh, but the name obviously comes from the Ghostbusters movie where Zool is the gatekeeper. And uh, that's basically what Zool is doing. Now, if I have time left, I'll actually show you what that means in a moment as well. Um, I would first like to do a small demo on, uh, on Eureka uh, together with uh, another project without a logo from Netflix called Ribbon. So these two are about service discovery and accessing services based on what you can actually find in such a registry. So for that, um, I'm going to leave my uh, talk uh, service running. I have another service, a microservice called the Review Service. It basically uh, serves up reviews for talks. I'm not going to show it because it's basically the same thing as the talk service, but then for reviews, like, like Uber for reviews. Um, so let me just start it up. And I have a little web application sitting on top of these two services. This is my conference application. Now, looking at this conference web application, you will see that it has a talk service. And 
if I ask this talk service for all of the talks that exist in my little application, it's going to make a, an HTTP request. And it's going to do that using this REST template, hard-coded localhost 8881 slash talk. So obviously, that's something we'll, we'll need to get rid of, right? We, we want to be able to say we need to just call this, this service and we don't really care where it is. So how are we going to do that? Well, for this, we're going to use Eureka. So Eureka is, like I said, another project from the Netflix table. And um, just like for the config server, uh, there is an easy way to just start up a Eureka server uh, using Spring Boot. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. The Eureka server that I'm going to start up, and let me just do that here, um, it is going to be single node. Now, obviously, no one in their right mind would ever run a central component like a service discovery and registration service as a single node in any application. So it, it's very much written to be run as a uh, multi-node thing. So it will complain here and there loudly, actually, about saying, I'm the only one here, I cannot find my peers. Um, if you see all of these red letters, um, that's actually uh, supposed to be there. And that's, that's just because I'm running it as a demo. So what is this thing? Well, I've just started it up. And uh, you can see here that Eureka gives me a dashboard where you can see all of the running services in your application and how many instances there are. This is very much written originally for, for Amazon Web Services, so you can see things like AWS availability zones here. Obviously, I'm not going to have that here on my local environment. Uh, but you can use this thing in other environments very well as well. In fact, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry uh, just released a new version that actually offers this as a service as well. Um, so how do you integrate with this? Well, again, uh, the easiest way is to use um, Spring Cloud support uh, with, through uh, the, the dynamic uh, or declarative uh, support. If we go back to the uh, Maven Palm here, I can add another dependency. And that dependency is going to be on something called Spring Cloud Starter Eureka. Um, this will do two things, basically. It will make sure that this application will register itself with Eureka as a server, uh, as a service. And it will also make sure that they can find the other services that are available there. So to enable that functionality, in this case, in my talk service, uh, I can use another application called Enable Discovery Client. So this is an abstraction, basically, because discovery could be done using Eureka, but it could just as well be done using something like Console that you have heard about on this conference before. Um, this thing will just check whatever is on your class path. And if you happen to have the Console supporting classes, it uses that. Otherwise, it just uses Eureka. Um, so that's actually nice to have. Um, how does it know where to find Eureka? There's two ways. You could use the config server, which is what I'm doing. So that was that key in application properties. And you could also do it the other way around and say all applications know where Eureka lives. And through Eureka, they will actually discover the configuration service. That's, uh, that's up to you, basically. But I'm taking the approach where um, Eureka is actually um, the location of Eureka is made available through the configuration service. So let me uh, restart my uh, talk app. Um, that should uh, register itself with uh, Eureka. Did I start Eureka? Yes, I did. Um, this thing works based on heartbeats. So all of these services, every 30 seconds, will tell Eureka server, I'm here or I'm still here. And if it's missing a couple of heartbeats, it will assume that it's no longer there and it will take it out of the service registry. This is not intended to be a immediate update, right? If Eureka gives you a list of services, you don't necessarily know that they are all still there. It's just that recently, they actually said that they were still there. Also, service, uh, services registering themselves can actually take, well, up to a minute to become available. You can see that my review service is already available. It's showing as being up with one instance here. Um, and uh, in a moment, my, uh, my talk service will become available here as well. There it is. So now, what I can do is um, I can change my code inside of my little web application to say, OK, rather than talking to all of these microservices that live inside of my environment based on some hard-coded configuration setting, I would really just like to be able to say, just call a talk service, find out where it is, it's running somewhere, and it's registered with Eureka, and you just figure it out. And that's exactly what I can do now. But not with this, because this REST template that I'm using here is just created. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let this REST template be dependency injected here. Um, so I'm just going to say, I'll explain this in a moment. 
rest template and then say there. So what I've done is I've used dependency injection and I've added a qualifier called load balanced. That add load balanced is not really strictly necessary for this application, but I would advise you to use it in general. It basically tells you, I want to use the special REST template that is created based on this discovery support. So this thing will know about my service registry. And what this allows me to do is to say, well, rather than going to localhost 8881, I just can connect to the talk service. So this becomes a logical name. And this is not something like a DNS lookup or anything. It will just be the application itself resolving this name into the actual uh, DNS name of the service that I'm trying to, uh, to address. So what we can do now is we can start up this conference application. There we go. And since my services are available, it's just running on localhost 8080. I should see my talks now. It's almost done. There we go. So you see my three talks from my talk service here. Um, and I can uh, click through on this. And I will get the talks. Uh, and I will also get the reviews from the review server that make this up. Right, so this is my talk. Apparently, I have some reviews already. I got a really low score from someone called Bert Ekman, who really likes to see more OSDI and less of Spring. Um, there are some other talks here as well, of course. So uh, here's one from this. this. is the morning talk from uh, Roberto. He was at 8. Poor guy. Um, but um, Oh, no, actually, this is the one from Yetro. And Robert, uh, Roberto uh, looked at it. Basically, you can see that this thing works, right? Um, what happens now is if I shut down my service, I will still have a problem, obviously, because I can discover services. But if they are actually not running, I will still not be able to make any calls to them. Um, also, even if I have multiple services, but they don't unregister quick enough, I'm going to have a problem again. And this is really where Hysterix comes in. So Hysterix is another framework from um, uh, Netflix, which allows you to build resilient applications. And resilience means a number of things, but I think probably the most well-known feature here is something called circuit breakers. So what circuit breakers allow you to do is say, when I find out that some service that I'm relying upon, this could be a local microservice, this could be a remote service from some partner, if it's not there or if it's not responding in a timely fashion, I'm just not going to talk to that service for a while. And I'll just immediately fail when someone tries to access it. This prevents a lot of issues. First of all, it prevents other services acting uh, in a bad manner, like becoming really slow, from making your service slow as well. This is a really important thing. You don't want this, these problems to cascade throughout your microservices architecture. It will also make sure that once this other service that has a problem comes back up, it's not immediately overwhelmed with a whole bunch of backed up requests that it, it missed uh, while it was down. Right? You simply don't call services that are currently not there. So how do, you, uh, how do you put this in your application? Well, there is a project um, called uh, Yavanica um, that allows you to use Hysterix in, um, in a declarative annotation-based manner. Uh, and that's what I'm quickly going to demo you, because it's quite easy to demo. So um, for example here, um, this is the method that calls my talk service. What I can do is I can annotate that, and I can say uh, I need uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, quick brain fart there, so let me quickly look this up. Yes. Um, we're going to make this a Hysterix command. And um, this Hysterix command annotation um, takes a number of uh, potential configuration values, and one of them is something called a fallback method. So that's exactly what I'm going to configure here. And I'm going to say I'm going to have a, a cached talks method. So this is simply another method that needs to be in the same class with the, um, the same uh, method signature. And uh, it will just call that one if it knows that the actual service uh, that I'm trying to call here is not available. So what I can do here is just create another method. It doesn't need to be public, so I'll just make a default called uh, cached talks. And this one will return cached talks. That means I actually need cache talks. So let me assign this and call it there. And um, even though this is just a demo, let's just do it properly and say this needs to be a volatile variable. Right. So 
Now, what this means is that whenever I call the server successfully, it will actually remember the results. It will locally cache that inside of this service. And whenever the backend service goes away, it will just fall back on this one. So for this, obviously, I need to restart. And um, in the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start another application because these circuit breakers actually expose information on their states. So you can see if they are uh, if everything is okay or if there is a problem maybe with some service. And there is a little dashboard that I can start here um, that, will, uh, that will show me that. So I'm going to start that as well. Um, what I can do now is I can uh, first go back to my application here. It should still work. And I can make a call and I see my talks. And what I can do now is I can go back here and I can kill my talk application entirely. So it's now out. First of all, I can still refresh here and see results. Now, that's not terribly exciting from a demo point of view, but you can see that I'm getting cache results. How do I know that this is in fact the case? Well, um, there is this little dashboard application that I just started up. And uh, what I can do here is I can ask it to listen to a stream of events that are being emitted by my Hysterix uh, support. And if I do that, um, then what I'll see is this, basically. I can see that I have a circuit breaker called All Talks, and currently the circuit is closed, which means it, it's supposed to be okay. We know that it's actually not okay because the whole service is down, but the thing is, this thing will not just say it's down and it will be down forever. It will just say, okay, it was down, so I won't call this service maybe for a couple of seconds, but after that, I'm going to give it another try. So to demo the behavior that you're seeing here, um, rather than doing this in my browser, I'm just going to. Uh, oh, that's actually fine. Uh, I'm just going to use a little tool to uh, put some load on this application. So let's say for the next 30 seconds, I want to make a whole bunch of calls to my application running on localhost 8080. Uh, let's see, what did I miss there? Probably this one. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. No, it's, a, it's a single tool. Well, in that case, uh, let's not bother and let's just put some load on it by hitting refresh consecutively. That will work as well. If we go now to the monitor, you can actually see this thing being read and you can see the circuit being open. So what it sees is I'm getting calls that are failing. Uh, what you will also see is that this thing will come back because I'm currently not getting any traffic and the circuit will eventually go back from open, which is the bad state, to closed, which means next attempt that comes in, we will actually try to call the service again. So if you expand this to a whole range of services, you actually get a nice dashboard that will show you all of these things uh, with their states. You can see the volume of requests that is coming in um, and a bunch of other stuff. Now there's one more thing I would quickly like to demo. This is the well, most well-known feature of Hysterix, this circuit breaker thing. And uh, there's an interesting tweet here from um, uh, Ben Christensen, who used to work for, um, for Netflix. He just uh, moved to uh, Facebook, actually. Uh, but he's done a lot of stuff, a lot of work on this stuff. And he says, well, actually, those circuit breakers are really overrated. We could just do without it, and we would still have a, a lot of nice functionality there in Hysterix. Because the most important thing there is actually something called bulk heading. So what's bulk heading? Uh, bulk heading is the, uh, the notion of a ship that is uh, divided into compartments, and if there's a leak somewhere, you only want that compartment to start flooding, and you don't want the whole ship to go down. Now, there is an analogy there, obviously, with services. Um, what I want is that if somehow a certain part of my application uh, doesn't uh, work anymore because some service in the back end is not uh, responding and I'm just keep on trying to, to call it, but it doesn't work, um, I don't want my whole application to blow up. Be for example, because I'm running out of request threads, maybe in my Tomcat application server or something like that. So I really want to isolate that into a compartment and that's exactly what the bulk heading does. Now, if you go back here, you can see that below the circuit, there's also a thread pool there. By default, every circuit breaker in Hysterix gets its own thread pool. And this one um, has 10 threads. It has a pool size of 10 threads. 
Um, so what that means is that as long as I'm not making more than 10 parallel requests, uh, all requests will just be allowed to go through to the backend. Uh, however, uh, if I'm making more, um, it will uh, prevent those other calls from being made so that I don't overload the other systems or my own system. And I will just fall back to whatever fallback I have configured. Now, in order to demo that, I really need to be able to put some parallel load on my system. So let me quickly try again. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so let's see what other... Uh, yeah, thank you for that. So um, this is just making a single call. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to increase the concurrency and I'm going to set it to 11, right? dial it up all the way to 11, basically. Um, and while that's running, I'm going to show you uh, the dashboard. And um, actually what happens now is I just restarted my talk application. And that one's still registering with um, Eureka. And then when it's registered with Eureka, that still has to be picked up by my client application. So as far as my client is concerned, there is no talk application at the moment. So this thing is blowing up, right? It's completely red. Uh, but this will be fixed in just a moment. And then when I run the thing again, then what you will see is that most calls that I make will just be OK. They will actually uh, do the actual call to the talk service. But some of the calls will actually trigger a fallback. And the circuit breaker will, uh, will show you that state. On the other hand, the nice thing here is that from a client point of view, there is no problem, because if, as long as we have these fallbacks, even if you are overloading the service, you will get the fallback and you will still get a nice response. Right? So that is the support for bulk heading. Now, I don't have time to show you any more uh, of that, but of course you can configure things like the size of the thread pool there. Uh, how many tasks do you want to queue up if your thread pool is being used fully? Maybe you don't want a thread pool because you have backend clients that are already well behaved um, and they will never take uh, more than a certain amount of time. Uh, so you want to do uh, semaphore based uh, instead. So that's all available there. There are some other stuff in Hysterix. You can cache requests, uh, you can do retries. There is integration with the uh, non-blocking Rx uh, stuff. But um, really, the, the circuit breaker plus the bulk heading is the, uh, is the important feature there. And hopefully, what you've seen here is that um, when you actually uh, want to use that in your Spring-based applications, it becomes fairly straightforward to do that. And not only is it easy to build in, you can also um, uh, see all of the information that's being exposed by that and um, therefore monitor uh, all of that. So to sum up, the whole movement towards distributed systems, microservice-based systems, introduces a lot of new patterns, it introduces new abstractions, and um, frameworks like Spring are very much um, intended to provide support for these common abstractions, uh, plug in different things like the Netflix stack, like things like Console, or Zookeeper, or ETCD, or whatever you may happen to be using, um, so that you don't need all of the boilerplate to integrate with all of those different services in their own particular manner and their own APIs. And it's an area that is currently exploding with activity. Um, so if you're interested in this, uh, make sure to uh, track the new developments. Uh, second release train of uh, Spring Cloud is about to come out. Like I said, they have released second milestone. First beta will be soon. And um, if you're doing any type of distributed development, being it microservices based or just a bunch of services that you need to, uh, need to run and operate in a Spring setting, I think this is definitely a project that is worth uh, investigating and, and using in your own projects. So that's that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time left for questions uh, here publicly, but uh, if you have any questions left, feel free to uh, come up to me afterwards and uh, we can chat. So thank you very much.